Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. We have a wonderful guest today. Today we will be speaking to David Friedman. With multi-platinum recordings, Broadway shows, Disney animated film, television scores, books, teaching, and a lecturing career, you're a little busy. No. David Friedman is truly someone who has made a major mark in all areas of show business and the human potential movement. David has written songs for Disney, Diana Ross, and many others, conducted and vocal arranged six musicals on Broadway and numerous Disney animated films, scored three children television series, has performed off-Broadway review, Listen to My Heart, the songs of David Friedman to audiences everywhere. He recently finished a 10-year stint writing and performing a song a month for the Today Show, Everyone Has a Song segment. David wrote The Thought Exchange, Overcoming Our Resistance to Living, A Sensational Life, and other books. His next book, Help, is on the way. So welcome. I'm so happy to have you on today. Nice to be here. The last time I saw you was in a swimming pool. Yeah, wasn't that nice? <laughs> Just a good memory of warmth and sun, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited to have you on and, and to talk to all my listeners and viewers about all these wonderful things that, that you do. But first, I wanted to ask you about the Thought Exchange. Can you tell us what that is? Okay, the Thought Exchange is, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, a metaphysical method that I created by accident. And uh, I've written several books on it. What it is, years ago, I was asked to uh, take over the artist support circle at Unity of New York. And uh, they were losing their leader and I was a successful artist and they asked if I would run it. And I went in and it was, as you might imagine, a bunch of artists sitting in a circle, supporting each other with affirmations. And people were saying things like, I am a world famous singer with millions of dollars in the bank and millions of fans. And I think, no, you're not. Why are you saying that? You know. And I realized that what people do is they kind of create this weird magic. Like if I say something in the correct way enough times, then whoever it is out there who gives out such things will hear me and hand it to me. And I thought this can't be the way the world works. So. As we worked with the notion of positive thinking, I began to see something that I knew for myself that we all know that if you take on a positive thought, that's the way to have a more positive life. And everybody knows that, but most of us don't seem to be able to do that. We take on the positive thought and in 10 seconds, we're back at the negative thought. So I thought, we're not stupid, we're not lazy, we're really trying here. Why is that? And I began to realize that if a positive thought was associated with a difficult or negative experience earlier in life, for instance, if you said at some point when you were a kid, I can do this, and you got slapped across the face and told, no, you can't, then anytime you take on that thought, you're ready for the slap. So you feel uncomfortable and you run to the negative thought, which I call the protective thought, to protect you. So like a child quickly learns, don't speak up or don't ask for what you want or don't, you know, don't plan on something. And they learn to think the other way. So what happens is those uncomfortable sensations are going to come up when you think that thought. They're meaningless now. So I teach people to think the thought they want to think, exchange the thought that's stopping them for the thought they want to think, but then do not expect to feel better, expect to feel whatever you feel when you think that thought. And so like I go on stage a lot, I do not feel comfortable as I'm walking on the stage. I'm shaking, my heart is pounding, my hands are shaking. And I know that that's part of going on the stage, if I can't be with that, I can't walk on the stage. 
And so I, I say to people, you wanna be famous? You wanna be successful? Are you willing to be that uncomfortable? And so I teach people, you can take on any thought you want as long as you are willing to feel what you feel in your sensations and not fight that and not make up a story about that. Doesn't that I think that's wonderful because I think that when people read The Secret, you know, it's simple. Put it out there, your intentions are out there, you manifest it, you get it. And now people like you are saying, hey, wait a minute, it, it's a little bit more complicated. Not that you have to complicate it, which is a, saying something very different, but you have to look at who you are and your experiences and, and how it feels. Like what that book to me left out is, how do you feel when you put it out there? Well, it, it, um, it perpetrates the lie that you're gonna feel good mm -hmm when you get success. Success is a really hard thing to handle for a lot of people. It's, it's complicated, as you said. So um, for instance, I say maybe the reason that my thought exchange, which certainly is very successful, but it's not like worldwide, is the people who are real like the secret promise you, you're gonna do this little thing, it's gonna be easy and you're gonna get what you want. Like you're gonna go on this diet, it's gonna be fabulous, you're gonna lose weight, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. lose it's uncomfortable. So I say, come to my workshop, pay me, and I guarantee you, you'll feel you'll leave feeling worse than you came in. Want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it's all about is embracing that pain that you know, we all have it. None of us are perfect. We all have our stuff, you know, um, but embracing it and saying, I don't need this anymore. I can let it go. And, and I, that's and really hard. Interesting thing, my thought about the phrase, let it go, doesn't mean this, it means let it go, let it keep going, let it move, let it, let my, um, I, I had a wonderful, I was getting a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award and Lucy Arnaz was presenting it to me and we're backstage pacing the floor nervously because she has to go out and expound on my virtues and then I have to go out and accept an award and sing and play. And she stops and she says, all right, what are my sensations? My throat is tight, my stomach is churning and my hands are shaking. And just as she said that, the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, won't you welcome to the stage, the one, the only, the fabulous Miss Lucy Arnaz. And she went, I can go out there with that. And she walked out. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. It's kind of, that reminds me of Donny Osmond was in Joseph and the Technicolor Coat and he like had a breakdown because he had such bad stage fright, you know? And, and you look at this person who was a child star, but you know, and I, I think he talks about it in a book or where, whatever I read, you know, saying it goes back to that. And he had to deal with getting pushed out onto a stage where it wasn't in his comfort zone and not being allowed to be afraid, that not being accepted, like you're afraid and you do it. You, you know, your mind makes up a story and you don't follow that story. You go, but, you know, I used to stand at the edge of the stage and go, my God, I can't do it, I can't do it. Now I go, oh, all systems go. This is the way it feels to walk on a stage, heart pounding, stomach churning, hand shaking, here we go, adrenaline. Well, or you could do it my way, which is I take myself out of my body. I go into my soul. I become a holograph. I walk onto a stage with, think of it. I could say the most ridiculous things to people if I'm doing a reading on a stage, but I'm fully confident that it's not me. It's not about me. And so I put my ego over there. That's right. That's right. And in fact, me is... The holograph, the emptiness, the, we do a lot of work and thought exchange with going to that emptiness, with going to the body, with not, this thing is just, uh, this thing cannot fix itself. This thing yeah. is just going on and on and on and on and on and talking and, and like my Jewish grandmother, looking for every possible danger and relating it to the past and saying, don't go there and don't do this and don't do this. And I go, yeah, grandma. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. And do it. So yeah, well, so, that's funny. 
you know, and being, I have to say, because you brought up your Jewish grandmother, being Jewish or Italian, we carry that energy, you know, um, I can't, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, it's like inbred in us. It's around us. That energy is us. We can we do carry the energy of our ancestors. And in your grandmother's case, she had a lot of good reason to feel that way. You know, she owned it. She was that way. She passed it on. Okay. And then you are saying right now, no, I stop that. I do not accept this. But yeah. And you see, and I can say, I don't accept it, but I can't stop it from being, no. I can just interpret it differently. So it's like years ago, Sean and I are very different. I'm a big hypochondriac. Uh, and so years ago, we both were having this bizarre symptom. It was like a buzzing sensation down the front of our bodies. And we both had it for about four months. The only difference between us is every time he got it, he assumed it was his chakras opening. And every time I got it, I assumed I was having an aortic aneurysm. So every time I was like, oh my God, and he'd go, ah, and it was the same sensations. So when someone says to me, oh my God, my heart is pounding, I'm dizzy, I can't breathe, I can't catch my breath, I'm hot and cold. I say, oh, are you having an orgasm? And in that context, welcome those very same feelings that you would call a panic attack Mm -hmm. and they're just your body doing something. Right? So do you see people in groups? Are you been doing it on Zoom? Well, I have a thought exchange Zoom group every Wednesday night at uh, five o'clock and uh, it, it's five to seven and it's people, you see, I've taught this all over the country and but now, and everyone keeps asking me, when are you coming back? Well, now right. I can all over the country. Uh, and so- great. We keep the group small and I charge 20 bucks for it. And it's usually about 10 people. And we do a thought exchange every uh, Wednesday from five to seven. And if anyone's interested, you just go to David Friedman composer at gmail.com and write to me and I'll let you know how you do it. And, and a lot of people do private sessions with me. You know, and, and you had, did you, and you wrote a book around this or a couple of books around this? I've written three books, the thought exchange, overcoming our resistance to living a sensational life. Uh, the a healing power of negative thoughts and uncomfortable sensations, stop being afraid of them and start using them to heal. And a workbook uh, called It's All Inside. Because another one of the principles of thought exchange is that the only place the world is happening is in my thoughts and my sensations. So I like to say, I can't even prove that you're there. I know I experience you. And here I could be dreaming. And so when something happens, we experience it as sensations and thoughts. You never can really get into the outside world. It's all here. And so what we are seeing is our thoughts. So like I was at a dinner party years ago and this woman was going through a miserable divorce and she really hated her husband. And she said that SOB, he has taken everything. He's left me destitute. I have nothing. I don't know how I'm gonna survive. The only thing he's left me is the apartment. I have to sell it to survive. So someone said, oh, what are you asking for the apartment? She said, oh, 7,750,000. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> now that's hilarious at first, but then you realize this woman has such an experience of destitution mm -hmm. that you look at seven million dollars and experience destitution because that's in her and nothing in the outside world will change that because the outside world is a mirror now some people take that to mean we're causing the outside world to happen like i'm thinking million dollars million dollars and then it will appear no the outside world is happening, but it is only reflecting to us what we think. So she says, I'm destitute. So she sees her husband leaving her. I'm destitute. She sees $7 million. She sees destitute. She sees. And so when you realize you're only seeing yourself and you're out of touch with the infinite possibilities that are always here because you're shutting 
down. You know, I don't write songs, uh, they write me. They're already there. Every combination is already in the ether, always has been, always will be. I don't know how to write a song. I know how to create a condition, just as I would imagine. You don't know how to contact spirits. You know how to open to that which is there and would be there for everybody if they knew how to right. open. Right. right. Uh, similar. What you're talking about is very similar to. Are you familiar with Ernest Holmes? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is like so Ernest Holmes. You know, for those that don't know, he wrote um, "Science of Mind." Um, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's, it's very consistent with what he wrote, and yet a little bit different. Okay, because you go deeper in a different way, where he's more in that Christ consciousness, you yes. know, and the expansion of that. Well, where I come in, it's like. Um, I come in and, okay, I understand this. How do, why am I not getting to it? Why do I read that? Where am I misinterpreting it? Or where am I, where can I just not get in? So usually it's something where, as we said, we have this idea that we're supposed to feel better. It's like a friend of mine said to me once, he said, I don't know why I drink so much. And I said, would you like to find out why you drink so much? And he said, I really would. I said, stop drinking. You'll find out immediately why you drink. You'll feel the discomfort that makes you do that. But he's looking for something comfortable and it's not comfortable. It's, you know, getting sober or getting, letting go of something, you're, You've set up, we all have set up these false selves, these personalities, these uh, uh, goals, these to stay away from a certain hurt. And when we remove them, which is what we say we want, we have to go through the hurt. And then there's a void that you yeah. need to fill with something. Yes, and that something is infinite, but we're so afraid of that void. So <laughs> once you get there, and once it fills you, you look at it and say, why did I wait so long? Yep. So it's worth going through that journey that we're, listen, we're all on this journey and we all have our pain and our hurts and we all have the good stuff too, you know? Um, but comfort zone's a, a big deal, you know? Just like, you know, misery, like people who are miserable, it's like, how do you shake them out of being miserable, you know? But this is all they know. And we all know people like that. And you think, wow. You're more afraid of that emptiness. And right. I understand it, you know, in, in the areas in which, because I find one of the things I love about this work and about teaching is like people say to me, they say, you're just amazing. I mean, whatever problem I bring up, you seem to understand it. And I say, because I have it. And, and when I'm really working with a singer, say, and really zeroing in on some issue, I look for it in my own work. I know that I'm working on it too. In some yeah, but way. that's by the theory of attraction. People will be attracted to the healer that right. can heal them. You know, yeah. that's just like the people that come to me, there's some kind of bonding and attraction to me. I mean, there's lots of mediums out there, you yeah. know, but they come to me because there's a comfort, there's some, there's an attraction and we we connect before we connect. It's right. still, like you said, it's it's in the air, it's in the ether, yeah. it's there, you know, yeah. which makes it so amazing. I'm so glad you're doing this. I really am. And I need it for myself. I mean, I really, I'm usually working, like a lot of times when I'm working with a client who has, you know, some major issues. I mean, there are people with eating disorders who come to me. There are people with uh, dissociative disorders who come to me. I'm not a therapist, but I, work in a different way. And generally, I will not say when you've been traumatized like you, I'll say when you've been traumatized as we have, you know, yeah. it's yeah. in this. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it takes away the discomfort. It's like, you're not judging me for my trauma. You're not judging me for my pain. No. It's so interesting, but you know, you know, it's, we are healed by the people that we associate with and that we're trying to help the whole, everybody. I mean, we, we've come onto this planet to heal each other. And right. the more we do that, the more we will be healed. 
you know, yeah. it's, you know, the more compassion you give, the more compassion you get back. So um, I think it's wonderful. I hope you write more books. I hope people come to you across the board. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to talk to you about your songs. Mm -hmm. um, you write a lot of songs with spiritual and inspirational themes. Yeah. Where does this come from? Do you have a muse? Do you feel it coming through you? Are you writing it? Is spirit writing it? What's, what do you do? What do you feel? Well, definitely spirit. I mean, I, um, as I said, I don't know how to write a song. Uh, I open and uh, generally a song writes me because I need to hear it. Oh. And so it's like, I always laugh because people say, oh my God, you write these songs, help us on the way we can be kind. We live on borrowed time. Um, you must be so spiritual and so centered. And so, and I say, if you think I think help us on the way, or if you think I trust the wind, you're out of your mind. I get these messages because I need to hear them. So I will have, like I have a show called Listen to My Heart. And it's my, it's an evening of my songs and it's me sort of writing them and five voices around me singing them to me through me and from me and so when i start i say to the audience thank you for coming to listen to my songs actually that's a misnomer because i don't feel i write them they write me and i go to the piano and i start playing and i said you know when i have some problem or some issue or something i'm thinking about i go to the piano and I listen for the voices, you know, the voices, same ones you hear. There are voices softly <laughs> whispering in my head, telling me I'm gonna be all right. They keep saying, let yourself be led where you are led. Don't hold back, don't put up a fight. They tell me, trust the wind, breathe the air. There's a place you're meant to be and you're already there. Open up your heart and let life in. You know that you can always trust the wind. And then everyone shatters around me. And, and so these are usually, and like years ago, uh, I'm a member of Al-Anon and uh, I was talking to my sponsor on the phone and I was really upset about something. And uh, she said, I wanna read you something. And she read me this such a, great inspiring passage and i said to her i said my god that is perfect that is just what i needed what book is that from she said oh it's from this book called the thought exchange by david friedman <laughs> oh, that's great <laughs> so it's not and you know sometimes i'll write a song and i'll go oh my god this song is so great and i'm not raving about me no that's how i feel like when people say to me oh it's so second nature to you sometime in the middle of a reading i'll say oh that's amazing and yeah. they look at me like because it's coming through me okay right. i'm not thinking of this and when they say oh i needed that and i'm sitting back saying that's wild how that came through me and i said it <laughs> and i'm not patting myself on the back i'm amazed I'm yeah. in awe of heaven. I'm in awe of these voices around me and these spirits around me. So I totally get it. And you're a conduit. Like I, when yeah. someone's oh my God, write one of those fabulous David Friedman songs. I go, I don't really know how to do that. I'll, I'll open and see what it has yeah. to write. So what happens when like you're writing for say a Disney show, when you know you have to write about something specific, does it still come through you like that? Yeah, well, you ask for it. And also what I love about writing for Disney is, you know, Disney is very commercial and the suits are, you know, making sure that it's a, but you know that millions and millions of people are going to hear this. So you sneak in the spiritual stuff. <laughs> but we, you see, when I would get an assignment like that, Earlier in my career, I would panic. And I think, oh my God, I can't write this. And then one day I realized I can't write this. Not me who writes it. And so I open and, you know, sometimes it comes quickly. Like when I wrote Help Is On The Way, Nancy Lamott called me from the road and said, I'm getting tired of my closing number. 
I'd like you to write me something. And I said, what do you want? She said, something that leaves people, that lets people leave the theater uplifted and hopeful. So I wrote the first part of Help Us on the Way. Just don't give up the ship even when you feel it's sinking and you don't know what to do that came to me. And I wrote the first part to the chorus, Help Us on the Way, from places you don't know about today, from friends you may not have met yet. Believe me when I say, I know, help is on the way. And then I was stuck. So I said, all right, put your money where your mouth is. If you're writing about help is on the way, get up, go to a party. And at that party, I had a conversation with Alex Corey about something entirely different that gave me the next idea, which was to take each line and think of a person, what some person I knew who was having some issue and what they might need to hear. You don't have to know where the path you're on is leading. You just have to walk along. Dreaming as you go, asking for the things you're needing, you never can go wrong. If you have faith that things are happening as they should and just believe each step you take is leading you to something good, help us on the way. And so now, I, I just wrote a book a few years ago on my song, We Can Be Kind, where I took each chapter and wrote essays. Each chapter was one line of the lyric and then wrote essays and stories about that. So my next book, I'm, I took the song, Help Us On The Way, and it was made for that because each line is separate. And so, but these things, it really is, and I'm, I know it's true in what you do, the process of preparing is really the process of getting out of the way. Yeah. It's the process of opening something and yeah. you are not dealing with your conscious mind. You're dealing with a different level and you have to let that level arise. And as you were alluding to, sometimes you go, really? What? Mm -hmm. This is coming up and you let it and you let the crazy idea like when I coach when I started I was like I prepared and I knew what I was going to say now someone sings for me or brings me a question I have no idea in the world what to say I just go yep that's how I am in my readings yeah and you it's know, I just go you know so whatever comes through my mouth comes yep. through my mouth and that's it and I write I write or I crochet because if I'm if I need to get out of that processing mind and if I'm doing something with my hands, I become more of an open vessel for that. Yes. So yeah, so it's it's really interesting. So so you've written scores for broad uh, for um, Disney. So yeah. can you tell me how you slip spirituality into like a Disney song? Well, for instance. Uh... They asked me to write the opening song for the sequel to Bambi. And you know, we're all influenced by Bambi because you know the mother dies. And here it goes back to that moment, the mother died again. You know, so it's so the first uh they asked me, they said, it's winter, everything is cold, everything is frozen, everything is hopeless. Can you write something hopeful? So I was on the plane going back from the meeting and came to me under the snow, beneath the frozen stream, talk about that emptiness, there is life. You have to know when nature sleeps, she dreams, there is life. And the colder the winter, the warmer the spring, the deeper the sorrow, the more our hearts sing. Even when you can't see it inside everything, there is life. And then it went to after the rain, the sun will just, and so it, it was about hope. Now at the end, I wrote, there is life forever. There is life. And one of the, you know, 18 year old executives said, you can't say that because we don't live forever. Hmm. And I said, and Sean, my partner, who is a unity minister said, Funny he should say that since Bambi's dead mother is singing the song. <laughs> I have to tell you, I think almost every Disney song is spiritual. That's why I asked you. 
it is. Yeah. And so, and so you put as much of that in and, you know, the thing about the, one of the big successes of the Disney movies is that they function on many levels. So the adults watching with the children can get a different message that's apropos to them. So you really want to, um, uh, I, I wrote a song for the um, Lizzie McGuire movie. And it was about how uh, Lizzie is on this trip and Gordo, her best friend, is with her and she falls in love with this Italian movie star and everyone can see that Gordo is the person who she should be with and she doesn't see him. So I wrote a song called Open Your Eyes to Love. You've been searching the world to find true love, looking in all the wrong places when all of the time you've been blind to love. It's plain as the nose on your faces. It's here, it's now. Open your eyes and see it right here, right now. Open your eyes to love. Love has been here by your side so close that you couldn't see. If love could speak, it would shout to the skies. I've always been here. I always will be. I'm here. I'm now. Open your eyes and see me. Now, that is about this guy, but it's really about, mm -hmm. the and the theme of the movie is that. So you write something that's the, the action, but the bigger theme, and you tuck it in so you stay with a plot but you're writing you're sending the message and my favorite thing um we did a show off broadway called desperate measures and it was very we did in 19 19 2018 and we won the drama desk we won the outer critics it was a big success and there was a song called it's good to be alive about how cactus on the plane strive why because it's good to be alive. And uh, Lauren Molina was in the show and she also did photography. And this young, delightful actor came to have his picture taken. And he said, I have to tell you a story. I was having a complete nervous breakdown and I went to my therapist and my therapist said, you leave here and you go straight to the hospital because you're suicidal. And he said, I have tickets to Desperate Measures. I'll go right after that. And he said, when I heard it's good to be alive, I had lost my desire to kill myself. And I thought, thank you. you know, that, That's what it's about, isn't it? That piece. Yeah, it has to talk. I mean, I think music, songs, I mean, they, I mean, they touch me so deeply. You yeah. know, you know, the words of a song, what they're saying, how they're saying it. It's just, you know, I'm one of these people that you, know, you I turn on the radio and I could be in the car crying, you know, just because it, it affected me that way. And I think it does for most people, you know, yeah. whether they want to admit it or not, but I do think it happens for most people. Because it gets under, yes. under the conscious mind. Yes. And, and it speaks to us. And there's no randomness, like, you know, you turn on the radio and a certain song comes on and it's like, wow, like that just shifted me. Well, you'll love this. Nancy Lamont, you know, who was, who was really my muse. She was a singer. I produced five of her albums and she was extraordinary. And she died at 43. And the night she died, oh, I just, I didn't sleep. I was desolate. So I put on all five of her CDs on shuffle to see what she would sing. So the first thing she sang was accentuate the positive. And I thought, all right, that's, yeah, okay. Then she sang help is on the way. And I burst into tears and I said, help is not on the way. Everything is over. This whole, I've spent all these years, we had so much going, I've lost her and the song finished. And then she sang, help is on the way again. Now, what are the chances that on shuffle, it was like, excuse me, and I went, okay. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's pretty yeah. amazing, right? You yeah. know, and, and the more you're awake to how they come through, especially through music, the more exciting it is. And the more you hear them, you yeah. know, 
like people come to me because they want the medium, you know, I'm the in-between and they think that they can't get these messages on their own. And I sit there and say, but didn't you hear the song that your mother sent you the other day? And they look at me and they're like, crazy lady, what song? And then they think about it as like, oh yeah, yes, I did. Yes, she used to sing that song to me and it always made me feel very loved you know, once you open up, it's exciting because it's always around the next corner, you know? And, I, and it's, it's not, as I said before, it's not even like, oh, this person is doing this. It's your openness to experience. It's completely your openness. It is. You know, it's like one of the challenges with when you have like palm readers, you know, and they go, you will get a lot of a million dollars. And Actually, what they're picking up is some energy that something excellent is going to happen for you. And that may be their interpretation of it, but it's not, it's not really what yours is. So the energy comes through and the person who receives it has to go, that and go. Well, they have to translate it. Yeah, what is this? Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's um uh it's really a constant openness without, uh, without figuring it out. I've spent so much of my life figuring things out and trying to control it. One of my favorite sayings, when someone says, I finally decided to give up control, I go, you had it? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, we are just, we're being lived. And so when this pandemic started, I said, you know what? I've been pushing so hard and I'm exhausted and I'm gonna sit back and let the universe take yeah. care of me. And it has in ways. I know, things, I did things. the same thing. Yeah, I say, I sit here like a baby bird and baby birds get fed. Yeah, I know. So the book you were talking about, um, Help is on the Way, is that out yet? Or is that being published? It's being published, I'm working on the audio book and they're publishing the, the uh, uh, hard copy. It's it's coming out, I think, in May. And the thing is, that song has had a big resurgence. I did this big uh, video of Help Us on the Way for Broadway Cares with 75 Broadway performers from all over uh, to raise money for Broadway Cares. And the, the, the theme of it is, it's not that, oh, do this and this will happen and this is where you get this. It's It's more about live in the knowing that there is help in ways you can't imagine. So I often, when I sing it for people, I sing it into a hopeless situation, into a hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. Like you, it may seem like everything is not working, but you have no idea how, where, when something could happen. So it's very, it's a lot of stories about keeping yourself in a state of mind in which it's possible to see the possibilities. And then there are sections on things you can do to put yourself in that mm -hmm. and things you can do for other people to help put them in it and thus put the world in it. Well, how apropos, I mean, the, it sounds like the book's about hope and isn't that what we need now? I mean, we need hope. And you know what it is? It's interesting because there's a section in it called hope and faith. And hope is I don't have something now and I hope it will appear. Faith is I know it's here and I don't know or where. And so I go, I know. That's why I say, believe me when I say, I know help is on the way. I don't know how, I don't know where, but I know. And moving ourselves to that sense. I call it in thought exchange, the great unmanifested. Everything exists. So I say, close your eyes and see where everything is. Find a penny. Got it? Got it. Find a billion dollars. Got it? Got it. It's it's a billion dollars is there as easy as a penny is there. It's all here. And depending on your willingness and also on what you really deep down require, a lot of people would drop dead if they got a billion dollars. You know, they would just not know what to do with it. And so it's, but it's just knowing 
in a quiet way, everything is here. And these songs remind me because I certainly forget as much as anybody. It's like, you know, Sean is a minister and one of his aces in the hole as a minister is he makes it very clear that he's working on everything he's preaching about himself and he's just applying spiritual principle to us all. And so he used to do his sermon, which is, you know, it's his work day, it's a stage day. He's very present, but it's pressuring. And so we'd have lunch and we'd come home. And about three o'clock I'd say, you know, honey, that spiritual principle that you are so beautifully expounding on this morning, not really seeing it in action at the moment, <laughs> you know? And he'd say some expletive, you know, like go. And so now he goes back to the church after lunch and he unwinds for a few hours and then we have dinner because he is also subject to the same things everybody is. Mm -hmm. And like when I teach at a college, I teach a master class, then I do a concert. And then I have a class where the kids critique me. And someone will say, well, you said that you're supposed to do this and you didn't do that. I said, oh, yeah, you noticed. I got nervous right there and I didn't really stick to it. To let people know, this is not, oh, I have arrived now and right. I am, this is all your life. You yeah, are. None of us are perfect. That's right. You are writing. And we're perfect in our, in, in our, in our imperfection. But I love what you said about, like, you, you say, I know, not I believe, I know. It's very different. Somebody posted on Facebook last week um, something like, I don't, I don't believe in God. I know. I don't believe there is a God. I know there is a God. Right. Very different statements. And when you put that out, I know that my tomorrow is going to be better. I know it. I have faith. I know it. Therefore, I have the hope. It doesn't mean you sit back and do nothing, you know? No. You function, you open, and you get the sign to do this, to pick up the phone, to do this, right. to do, you know. Yeah. Not just, you know, people think they just sit back and it's like, okay, bring it on. It's like, not quite that way. Yeah. If they, if it's brought to you, then do something with it to promote it, to get it going. And I, not everybody really understands that. And so well, they say, yeah, well, how can you have faith or how can you hope? Go into the emptiness. Yeah. Then fine ideas pop up. They just, they just do like pick up the phone. So when, now this is an example of thought exchange. So you, when it says, pick up the phone, your mind might say, oh no, I'm too afraid to call them. I'm this and that, I'm whatever I, and you pick it up. I had one person in thought exchange. She was in her forties and she said she used to be a great fundraiser and now she's like frozen, she can't do it. So I said, I want you to go to the phone, feel your sensations, whatever they are, pick up the phone and dial. Nowhere did it say, feel better about it, get yourself psyched, just do that. So she came in, she said, I went to the phone, I got a huge hot flash. I picked up the phone and I raised a lot of money. So I said, okay, here's your affirmation. Here's a hot flash, I'm a great fundraiser. And so it may be that fundraising comes with a hot flash. If you decide you can't be with that hot flash, you will make up a story that that means you can't make funds. It means nothing of the kind. It means you get hot flash when you pick up the phone. Right. Yeah, that's great. So then you wrote a book called How They Met, which I actually have. Yes. It was given to me by someone that's in the book. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, it, it's a great, it's a great book. But what made you write that? What happened was, because that's not really in my real house, although I put out a CD of 17 songs that go with that book because I write about longing a mm -hmm. lot. What happened was um, about, oh, over 20 years ago, I was in a long relationship and it ended in one day, not by my doing. It just was like, it was out of there after 15 years. And I was 
devastated. And I was lying in bed one night and thinking my life is over. I'm never gonna be happy again. And suddenly this thought came to me that whoever it was I was going to meet was already in the world and was somewhere. And someday we'd have the story about how I was in Europe and I was on the train and I was going to Czechoslovakia and I sprained my ankle and I went to the hospital in Prague and there was a nurse there and he was really lovely and we bonded and we went for coffee and now we've been together for 20 years. Uh, you know, and so there's some, so I wrote a song called, You're Already There. You're already there waiting for me, wondering where in the world I could be. You go through the day dreaming a dream, afraid that it might not come true while I'm lying here dreaming of you. And so at the end it said, so in a funny way, you're already mine. It's just, you have to be. And I wrote that song. And one of the things I did to heal, it took three years till I met Sean, three long years. And one of the things I did to heal was I interview couples of long standing to find out how they met. And what I discovered was the role of serendipity. There's no, you know, there are a lot of books on you want to meet someone, you go out, you target, you this, you make calls, you get out there. It was one, the first book story in the book is called Pooper Scooper Romance. A guy was walking his dog. He forgot the pooper scooper. He picked up a piece of newspaper from the trash. There was a personal ad in it. He answered and he's married to that woman. Oh, uh, you know, great. The, <laughs> that is a great story. So everybody, there was one, I will never, 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 never marry another actor. They're happily married for 30 years. And so to notice that just go through your life. There's some people who really get out there there's some people who say, no, 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 no. I never want to meet anybody again. And someone falls through the ceiling, you know? And so I, uh, and again, it's not about how to meet someone. It's not, so last Valentine's day or yeah, last Valentine's day, I did a concert where I told the stories and then had people do a song that was related to it. And so a friend of mine said, I was so reluctant to go because oh, it's Valentine's Day and I'm single and I don't. And she said, I walked in and the whole concert was, as you say, about hope and faith. The whole concert was about, I have no idea how I'm gonna meet someone and it doesn't matter what my circumstance is right now. It could seem absolutely hopeless. And in five minutes, I could meet the love of my life in a way I never dreamed. So just open up. And she began to, you know, open. I had someone online, you know, during the pandemic and he was really, I'm so alone and I don't have anybody and how can you meet someone? And I said, just read the book. And he met someone. I mean, it just in this weird online way. And so- yeah, I find that all weird when the online, this whole online dating, but you know what? My son met his wife that way. I love a lot of people that have met, you know, their their loves that way. It's just, it's the energy. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you just don't know. And, you know, there, as I say, more and more, and it's hard for me to let go of it. It's frightening, but to go, I am being lived by spirit. Mm -hmm. I am not. Uh, I remember I was doing a musical with Kathy Lee Gifford and she's very, you know, fundamentalist Christian. And we were doing a presentation and she said, let's pray. And she took my hands and she said, dear God, we know that you are in charge and that we are just here to serve you. And that whatever happens is what's supposed to happen. And you are taking care of us. Amen. And I said, well, Kathy, I'm going to let God be in charge for a couple hours, but if he doesn't do a good job, I'm taking it back. <laughs> it's like, that's ridiculous. You know, you yeah. never, and people think, people think like, like someone will say, well, how come he's still drinking? And I was able to stop. I'm more, you know, I have more discipline. I go, 
What gave you that discipline? What enabled you to find that? It's, it's grace. It's not, you know, it's not me. And so when we do that, it's very scary, but then we kind of realize we're opening to such a bigger palette, such a- yeah, The people love to be in control. They don't realize how much easier life is when you give it up and you co-partner with spirit, you know, it doesn't mean you're giving up all your control, but it's coming from a different place. And there's something so beautiful about working, you know, with divinity. And the thing is though, we always are. I mean, divinity does not ever move away from us. Mm. Like when people say, I do a meditation at the beginning, a thought exchange where we go under the mind, under the sensations to the emptiness. And people say, I can't find it. I can't get there. And I say, just know it's there all the time. The silence, spirit, it's always here. It's not running from you. It's waiting for you to open and we're working on opening to it and, but just to shift and go, I know it's there. So even when I think, uh, there's a wonderful story Sean tells and it's about a man who has, uh, he's really struggling financially and he's closes his eyes to pray. And he says, God, I know you can do this. I need one pot of gold, just one pot of gold, please. One pot of gold, thank you, amen. Opens his eyes nothing. Closes his eyes, says, God, maybe I didn't make it clear. My wife is sick. My son needs clothes for school. No. One pot of gold. Thank you, God. Amen. Nothing. One more try. He goes, God, please, what do I have to do to let you know that I need this pot of gold? I know you can do it. Please, one pot of gold. Thank you. Amen. He opens his eyes. There's a pot of gold sitting there. He goes, oh, never mind, God, I found one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And people do that all the time. It's like, yeah. oh, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this has been wonderful. I mean, I think that your message of hope and faith and what you're doing with the thought exchange and, and just being human, that we're all in this together, we all feel the same way can help so many people. And I hope it can really help the people that are listening to this podcast today, um, because you have so much to say, you're so dynamic and you do it with a sense of humor and a smile. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been such a pleasure. I hope everybody enjoyed the, today's episode as much as I did. If so, please like, share, and comment, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never mi miss an episode. And David, I'm so happy we had you on. I love you, love you, love you. And love I you. so appreciate what you're doing for the world. Thank you. This was totally fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun, right? <laughs>